Thank you very much. Um, I'm an old-fashioned kind of person, and I believe in handouts, so I prepared two of them, but I'm afraid there aren't enough copies of either one of them, so we're going to have to project on the screen. Can this be scrolled down to see uh, what's on it? Yeah, great. OK, like, like that would be good. OK. Um, so um, the, the full paper on which uh, this is based uh, is about 39 pages, and it's about to be published uh, by the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies, the AACAN, the Journal of Asian and African Studies. It should be out uh, within a few weeks, I think. Um, I gave a short summary of this paper at the uh, Sino-Tibetan Conference in Guangzhou uh, two years ago, but I only had about 10 minutes, and uh, it wasn't very satisfactory. So um, the two handouts which I uh, needed uh, this one, and then an appendix. I thought I would add an amusing appendix about an English uh, morpheme, a, a performative, which coincidentally has the same shape, ah, uh, to demonstrate kind of similarities and differences. Um, and a sort of lighthearted thing before the banquet. So anyway. Um, this is a simplified version of the Proto-Tibeto-Burman syllable canon. And uh, these are prefixes. Uh, this, the innermost prefix, I assume to be older, and the outermost, the outer one, to be uh, newer. I can give you a simple example. The word for to lick is reconstructed this way. But in uh, Tankul Naga, you have a form like this. But this is clearly secondary, because almost all verbs in Tankul have the prefix k. So this one goes back to proto tibeto burman and this is uh, secondary. So that's why there are two here. This is the initial consonant. This is a glide, uh, R, L, W, Y, vowel, maybe vowel length, final consonant, and uh, an S suffix. The status of tone at the proto level is still controversial. Some people, like uh, my guru Benedict, believes you can believed you could reconstruct tone for proto tibeto burman uh, I personally believe that tones have come and gone in the history of the family many times, because this is a language family which is hospitable to tones, tone prone. Um, so what I want to talk about today is the prefixes which can go back to proto tibeto burman These. And um, several are set up for proto tibeto burman S, M, uh, B, D, G, uh, R, L. These are by far the most important uh, because they have the clearest semantic content. S is a causativizer or a transitivizer. M is the opposite of that. Uh, in a directed or state of meaning instead of outward directed, causative or transitive. These uh, occur sporadically and look as if they're reductions of uh, initial syllables and compounds, although they're so ancient that it's uh, now very hard to demonstrate that. <clears throat> so among these prefixes is this one, which is reconstructed as a. Ah. And uh, I believe this is a uh, a serious oversimplification because, uh, well, in the first place, all the other prefixes are consonantal. But in many of the daughter languages, you have this form. And it's not nice to leave out glottal stop, even though in some languages uh, it's automatic, as in German, before a vowel. But um, <clears throat> Mary Haas used to say that uh, if you don't write glottal stop, you might as well not write T. So I uh, sort of believe that. Um, so I would like to look at this prefix from two points of view. I call this morphosyntactic, from a morphological point of view and from a semantic point of view. So uh, did I say morphosyntactic? I meant morphosemantic. Morphosemantic. Um, the morphosemantics are um, summarized in this monstrous chart here. Um, you notice, by the way, that this syllable canon goes beyond the simple monosyllable. Once you have prefixes, uh, you usually get them vocalized by schwa or a or some other vowel. So 
it's really sesquisyllabic. Sesqui, of course, means one and a half. And uh, this sort of a syllable structure is uh, rampant in Southeast Asia. It's a hallmark of the Mon Khmer family. And it also is um, very obvious in certain branches of Tibeto-Burman. So this is a necessary stage between disyllabic, sesquisyllabic, monosyllabic. And changes of syllable structure uh, uh, happen with distressing regularity. So um, what I want to do, instead of just reconstructing the ah, the full, whoops, the full um, morphophonemic range of uh, this prefix is on page two of this handout here. Um, first of all, I want to reconstruct both stressed and unstressed variants. And in addition, um, we need uh, both open syllable and nasal final variants. Now this is perhaps the most uh, difficult to accept of my hypotheses here. Ah, there it is, yes. Um, yeah, on this first page here, I take an arbitrary uh, syllable ta and show what happens to it in the various languages. So, many languages uh, have disyllabic forms with a fully syllabic ah. Uh, these include uh, several languages described by uh, uh, Shintani Tadahiko. Um, uh, Shanke, Zotung, Zayeng. Shanke is a Naga language. Uh, Zotung is a Chin language. Zayeng is a Karenic language. You have Tibetan and Lahu. Um, so many other languages in the family are of this type, fully disyllabic with a, uh, an initial A ah with a glottal stop. Uh, other languages have an unstressed variant. Uh, the most important language uh, from that point of view is Burmese, uh, which uh, has the unstressed variant A. Ah with uh, this consonant before the, the root. Uh, this is such a pervasive prefix in Burmese that if you start writing a dictionary uh, of Burmese, you would have to uh, duplicate almost every entry. Uh, Madame Bernot talked about this in that film we saw the other day, because uh, uh, it's an extremely productive prefix. It sometimes converts. Uh, verbs into nouns, but sometimes it's just there for phonological bulk to give the, the word uh, greater uh, uh, phonological power. Okay, now here comes something uh, that some people might find hard to uh, accept. Um, there is a phenomenon which I have called rhinoglottophilia uh, in an article written back in 1975. Uh, I know it sounds like a disease or maybe even a perversion, but um, by, uh, by rounded glottophilia, what I mean is the connection between glottality and nasality, and the, uh, the interesting fact that syllables with uh, initial laryngeals, H, uh, glottal stop, or zero, very often have allophonic nasalization uh, in them. And uh, the many, um, in the full handout, um, this is discussed on page four and five. Uh, a language like Thai has nasalization in syllables that begin with glottal stop or H. So the word for five, written H-A-A, -A, is for ha, uh, to take ao, glottal stop, A-W. Um, uh, Auk, to, uh, to leave. Um, Lahu is another language like that. The numeral for four is o but it's usually pronounced on. Uh, on to bend, ha elephant, ha to wrap up. And you can see you can get both the nasal and the glottal feature in the same syllable. Ha has both a glottal stop and a nasal. Um, uh, Yiddish also has a few examples like this. Uh, the word for um, 
Jacob in Hebrew is Yaakov, but in Yiddish it becomes Yankiv or Yanko. This glottal stop is realized as a nasal in, uh, in that word, many other words. Um, my uh, colleague, John O'Hala, who's a phonetician, and I have had many discussions about the connection between nasality and glottality over, over the years. And uh, he has uh, elaborate explanations based on both articulatory and aerodynamic factors. These are discussed on page, uh, on page four. Um, I'll just quickly read through this. Vowel nasalization frequently, frequently occurs in the environment of laryngeals because, for one thing, nasal oral coupling has negligible acoustic or perceptual effect on laryngeals, so that people are free to follow the principle of least effort, not bothering to raise the velum when it is not absolutely necessary. And secondly, there's no aerodynamic requirement for velar closure in the articulation of laryngeals. Um, uh, it's also true that there's a preference for low vowels in order for this nasalization to take place. Um, and the reasons for that seem to be um, the main effect of nasalization on sonorants is a downward shift in the region of the first formant. Thus, the lower the first formant of a vowel is to begin with, the less apt it will be to suffer the further degradation of a downward shift. Since low vowels have higher first formants than high vowels, they are less resistant to nasalization. Okay, so what I want to claim is, um, can we go back to uh, the original chart, this one, this one here. That um, via rhinoglottophilia, there are still two kinds of results. You can either get the stress variant or the unstressed variant. Um, the stress variant would have like a full syllable ang before the root. We're taking ta as the uh, uh, arbitrary root. Um, so languages like Nikir, uh, a lot of southern Lomish languages like Bisu, Pona, Ponoi, Lahu. Uh, the Lahu vowel, O, by the way, regularly comes from Ang. That's one of the main sources of O. Um, okay. Um, there's a further, there are further wrinkles. Some languages have a pre-palatalized variant. So Mikir, Lota, Aka seem to have a, a, a Y element or a Yod element before the uh, prefix. Uh, other languages go further and drop the vowel altogether. So you just have pre-nasalized initials. Or in the case of Lahu, the Lahu voice series comes from an original pre-nasalized series. So um, you get all the way from disyllabic things like Angta to things like Da or Nta. Um, can we go up a little more, please? Um, scroll down a bit. Uh, yes, uh, there's a further development uh, peculiar to Lahu and maybe some other languages, uh, maybe some of you have data on other languages, where there's um, a variant ah in the high rising tone. And I demonstrated a long time ago that the Lahu high rising tone comes from syllables with two glottal incidents in them, a glottalized initial and a glottal stop final, which comes from final PTK. So um, it's a very pervasive variational process in Tibetan Burman that you get alternation between homorganic final stops and nasals. So Lahu went a further uh, distance and has a variant ak, which became a. So in fact, Lahu has three different a prefixes. It has a, it has o, and it has a. This one is from plain a, although the glottal stop disappears in Lahu. This is from ang, and this is from ak. OK. Now, where do these variants occur? So. Let's go to the first page of the other handout, where I go into the semantics of the thing. This is the one that says, uh, which has figure A, semantic flowchart of the PTB R prefix. Yes, there we are. Okay. 
I think the uh, basic meaning of this prefix is something like uh, inalienable permanence. Um, and what, what are inalienably possessed things? First of all, one's own name is inalienably possessed. So typically, um, this uh, prefix occurs before people's names. Uh, kinship terms, one's relatives are things you can't get rid of. They're inalienably possessed. Um, so there are two kinds, there's both vocative and referential. And I think uh, in many languages, this a prefix uh, is a marker, like in Chin languages, of the third person. And I think that ultimately comes from this kind of uh, kinship use. Um, parts of the body are certainly inalienable. And genitives, things which you possess, you have more or less permanently, unless something bad happens. Uh, okay, so these are nouns. But then uh, the prefix also occurs with verbs. Um, with colors are sort of ambiguous in Tibetan Burma between nouns and verbs. They have verbal qualities and they have um, uh, nominal uh, characteristics. But colors are also, uh, even though things can change in color, that's sort of inalienable. If a house is green, it's not going to turn red tomorrow. Uh, uh, and then by extension, you get adjectives, which in Tibetan Burma and Southeast Asia in general are really stative verbs. And uh, qualities are things which are more or less uh, inherent. Um, so you can see how quasi-permanent qualities can extend to that. And finally, you even get action verbs with this prefix sometimes. Um, uh, a verb which is nominalized uh, is more permanent in a way than if it hasn't been nominalized. And then finally, showing bleaching of function, you sometimes get this prefix where there's no good reason for it, but it seems it's there for a phonological bulk. So uh, morphologically, it's complicated, and uh, semantically, it's kind of complicated. But, uh, and it's also true that in some languages, an ang prefix is differentiated semantically uh, uh, from an a prefix. But that doesn't mean necessarily that they don't have the same origin, because once things have different forms, they can uh, uh, undergo semantic divergence, which is what has happened. Um, so one uh, side benefit of this paper, I think, is uh, to discuss the mysterious Tibetan letter called A Chung, which uh, seems to have both nasal and glottal characteristics, as we'll see in the later part of the paper. OK. Um, speaking of nasality, let's look at the different possibilities there are for um, uh, nasal consonants in Tibetan. This is on page five of the bigger handout. <clears throat> so sometimes you get a nasal consonant plus a full vowel, as in lota. Um, go up a little bit. Yes, there we are. Yeah. Um, sometimes uh, you get a nasal consonant plus schwa, like uh, m in Jingpa, a very common prefix. Uh, sometimes you get a syllabic nasal homogamic with a root initial, like mb, which you also get in uh, Jingpa. Um, sometimes you get a glottal stop plus a full vowel plus a nasal consonant, ang. Sometimes you get that, except it's unstressed and becomes ng. Sometimes the nasal consonant disappears altogether and you just have nasalization of the vowel. You have a. And then sometimes, um, you, uh, you suffer a uh, disappearance of the vowel, a pharesis of the vowel, and you just have a monosyllabic uh, b, b, b. OK, and this is analogous to the continuum of erosion of nasal final consonants that you find, say, in Lolo Burmese, where uh, the, the protoram am in modern Burmese uh, is reduced to a, but in Lahu, uh, the nasality has disappeared altogether and is replaced by a difference in quality of the vowel. Okay. So now let's go back to um, 
page two of this handout, which says semantics of the a prefix. So the stressed uh, version of the prefix a occurs widely in kinship terms. Uh, Wolfenden, the great pioneer in Tibeto-Burman morphology, his 1929 book, Outlines of Tibeto-Burman Linguistic Morphology, um, uh, noted that uh, it occurs widely in kinship terms. Uh, some written Tibetan kinship terms are listed in the bottom of the page. Um, by the way, I just uh, received a copy of Yankee Modi's Milang uh, grammar, and there on page 120, she talks about um, are being used with kinship terms. So in that uh, macro tiny language also, you get the same thing. OK, uh, going on to Jingpa. Uh, Jingpa has a prefix which used to be written ah, but Leroy Moran changed it, uh, made it more accurate uh, to uh, and later revised it to uh with a glottal stop. And Moran was the first to observe that um, vocative forms of kinship terms, up, which begin with a sonorant, are pronounced with glottalized initials. So, daughter-in-law, nam, nam rather, na, elder sister, father, wa, grandma, woi, maternal cross cousin, ning, mother, nu, and so forth. Uh, Leroy was the first to uh, note that there were pre-glottalized initials in Jingpo. Um, that's a, a a big discovery. OK, uh, Lahu has two kinship prefixes, a, which is usually vocative, and o from ang. These are both used uh, in kinship terms. The a tends to be vocative, and the o is more referential. OK, uh, we already mentioned genitive constructions and the uh, pronominal prefixes in uh, languages like the Chin group. Uh, but sometimes, it's, uh, the function of this prefix is quite elusive, and uh, I'm uh, forced to just uh, have refuge in the concept of phonological bulk. So for example, sha in Lahu means meat or a game animal, uh, but in compounds it means flesh. So you get uh, uh, va is pig, va sha is pork, but if you have the prefix o or sha, it always means meat or flesh. It cannot mean animal. So uh, here, it's not just phonological bulk exactly, but it's uh, some kind of semantic differentiation. By the way, you uh, often get cognate object constructions in Lahu where you have a, uh, a noun with the all prefix and then the identical uh, verb without the prefix. So ti uh, is to wrap something. Or ti means a package. So it's kind of a nominalizer there. But then you get constructions like o ti, ti ve, to, uh, to wrap a package. It also is a classifier. So o ti te ti means one package. So you can say o ti te ti ti ve. You have three instances of ti. The first one uh, is with the prefix o, and it's a noun. The second one is just ti without the prefix, and it's a verb. And then you can get it after a numeral, where it's a classifier. So in the full version of the paper, uh, I give a lot of examples of the fully stressed prefix. Um, uh, I already mentioned the uh, languages uh, uh, discussed by Shintani, uh, Shanke, uh, Zotong, Zayen. There are others, too. Um, the uh, Tankul Naga has the same prefix. A recent uh, dissertation has the identical prefix in Tankul Naga. OK, looking at southern Lolowish now, um, page 6, we see in languages like uh, Bisu, Punoi, uh, Bien, which is uh, uh, another language studied by Shintani, you get uh, sometimes the full syllable ang. <coughs> sometimes uh, it's reduced to just the nasalized vowel ang. And uh, in the case of Lahu, it becomes O. Uh, Rawangish used to be called Nungish, but that's an inaccurate term. You get the unstressed variant, very ng. Uh, uh, Wadam Kong, another language studied by 
Shintani, uh, has both the a uh, and the ang. And they have slightly different functions. But as I said before, just because uh, they might have slightly different functions doesn't mean they necessarily can't go back to the same root.